take your Bible or a Bible there in front of you or electronic form of such and go with me to Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. Uh, I would guess that it's probably common human experience that we like new things. Is that not just the case with me? I would assume that that's the case with you as well. Perhaps even over the holiday season, you receive gifts. And I don't know if you have thought about some of those gifts, but I'm, I would guess that probably for a number of you, uh, you received a gift that you had gotten in a different form in the past. Okay, in other words, you may be just, just as thrilled with it that, that maybe in the past you received a certain gift and you got a new one of those. All right, for instance, I'm wearing this morning for my beautiful wife a very nice new watch. Okay, that was the Christmas, one of the Christmas presents that, that she gave to me. And I'm, I'm thrilled. I think it's a very nice watch. It, it, it keeps time. That's kind of important for a watch, right? And my wife is saying, don't forget about the time that you have to, for this service this morning and uh, be mindful of that and all that. Maybe that's why she gave me the watch. Maybe I'd been uh, preaching some especially long sermons lately and she wanted to make sure I had a, a new watch. But uh, my other one is falling apart. Literally, the band is falling off of it. Actually, two of my watches, the band is falling off. And so I'm, I'm grateful to have something new. And maybe as you think about the Christmas presents you received, perhaps there are some things like that that you already had one of those, but it was getting old. And man, it's kind of nice to have something new. We're, we tend to like new things. That's just part of our human experience. And I think part of uh, of just the way we're designed. Well, today we're going to be talking about something that the Bible calls new as well that ought to thrill our hearts far more than, than anything new we received as gifts. And it's this idea of the new covenant. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28, I trust is familiar to you because we read this or one of the other New Testament texts that say something very like this almost every single time we come to the Lord's table. It says this, it says, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. We see it in this text in Matthew chapter 26. We see it in Luke 22, Mark, Mark or chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 11, 25. And it's stated a little bit differently in each one. For instance, in Mark 14, 24, the Bible says, This is my blood of the new covenant. Luke 22, 20 says this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And then I'm accustomed to typically quoting in our communion services from 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, where it says this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And then Jesus says, drink you all of it in remembrance of me. And so we have here this phrase, the new covenant. And it's interesting that even the very word that Jesus chose to describe this covenant, the word for new has a unique meaning in that there are two primary Greek words for, for new in the New Testament. And the word that Jesus uses here is the word kainos, which means new in terms of quality, new in terms of it being different, new in terms of it being better than the old, and new in terms of it being superior. That, that, that the cup the, and his blood is, is a part of this new covenant, not new as in the other Greek word that could, he could have used was neos or neos, which means new in time. And so he says, I, this is the cup of my, my new covenant. My, I would guess, though, this morning that for a lot of us, we're not exactly sure what that means. I mean, that may be a nice scriptural talk, and you, of course, I think are probably generically familiar with it, but maybe for some of us here this morning, you've been listening to those words, New Covenant, for decades without really fully comprehending the significance of what Jesus was teaching and what the New Testament teaches about this thing called the New Covenant. And so this morning, I want to explain to you what the New Covenant is so that you can with me be thrilled by the fact that we get to be the benefactors of this new covenant. Of course, you can't be thrilled about something that you don't understand. So we are the beneficiaries, excuse me, not benefactors, but the beneficiaries of this new covenant. But what does that mean? I hope this morning in the next 25 minutes or so to answer that question for you so that each time you hear me or another pastor say this cup is the cup of the new covenant you know what it is that's being spoken of and it can thrill and grip your heart let me also say this morning that we are going to take a view from about thirty thousand feet okay you're accustomed in my normal preaching and teaching style for us to really zoom in almost like a microscope on individual words and phrases 
and dig into one text of scripture, that will not be the case this morning. We're going to view, uh, take the view from 30,000 feet. I'm going to cover a lot of scriptures. The references will be there on the screen for you. I've also printed out the PowerPoint for those that would like to do further study because we won't have the time this morning to really zoom in. But I would encourage you to be, as the book of Acts speaks, Bereans who studied the scriptures daily to see if such things are so. I would encourage you to go back to all these different passages of scripture and look them up for yourself so that you might fully understand what the Bible is teaching about this new covenant. And so notice with me this morning, quickly, three different things in relationship to the, the new covenant that we celebrate every time we participate in the Lord's table here at First Baptist Church. First of all, I want to make sure we understand the concept of a covenant. What exactly is a covenant? It's not a super common term for us to use in our day and age. And so to explain that, a covenant is an agreement. It's a, it's a working arrangement, so to speak. It's a contract, if you want to use that type of terminology. And in the case of biblical covenants, it's a, a working arrangement between God and his people. Tim LaHaye, I think, describes it in, in good terms and concise terms when he says the following. A covenant is a contract between two or more individuals who agree to abide by the terms stated in the covenant. In a similar, similar way, God's covenant states certain promises that he will fulfill. In a covenant, God binds himself to his people to keep specific promises so that he can demonstrate what kind of God he is. Covenants usually involve intent, promises and sanctions and frequently they are connected to bible prophecy end quote so the bible is full of examples of these types of covenants these types of things and so not only should we understand what is how to explain a covenant but we ought to also note uh, how covenants were exemplified in the old testament in in genesis chapter 8 we see the Noahic covenant between Noah and God and his people right after the flood where God promises that he will never again destroy the entire world by a flood. And there, that, that covenant as it's being formed, an animal is sacrificed as a part of that covenant. And then the Abrahamic covenant, and we see that in Genesis chapter 12 and 15 and 17. And in this case, the animals were actually cut in two. The sacrifices were cut in two and God walked between the sacrifices. And in that Abrahamic covenant, there's the promise to, to the descendants of, of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, the nation of Israel, there's a promise of land and there's a promise of seed, speaking not only of his descendants generally, but also of his descendant, capital D, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and then the blessings that came along with it. We have that very powerful statement in Genesis chapter 12. In verse 3, that says this, I will bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Powerful statement, both in terms of messianic ramifications and in terms of the seed of Abraham being Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and it was, would be through Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham, that the entire world would be blessed because it was through Christ that we then are the recipients of salvation. But also there's even political ramifications and, and all that's going on in the world today in the Middle East and all the saber rattling that's happening there for, for God to say, I'll bless those who bless your descendants is significant even for us as, as a nation in that we have historically as a nation been a very pro-Israel nation. That has not been the case here recently. If you paid attention at all to the news and the abstention of the United States of America from the Security Council vote that took place in relationship to the settlement of the West Bank and, and, and in a historic manner, our president chose to, to have our representative there in the UN not vote against a referendum that would uh, really condemn Israel for uh, their position in relationship to the settlement of the West Bank. That's a, that is a significant thing. A significant thing in light of the fact that, the, that God says, I will bless those who bless my people. And historically, part of why the United States of America has been blessed by God is because we've been very pro-Israel in our politics, in our world relations. And so significant statements are made in these, in these covenants, like the Abrahamic covenant, like the Mosaic covenant in Exodus chapters 20 through 24, and really repeated in the book of Deuteronomy. And you have verses like in Exodus chapter 24, 
uh, verse 8 and 9, where Moses sprinkles the blood of the sacrifice in the people, and he says the following. He says, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. And so in these three covenants, there's this, this common thread of blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins that fits with the the pattern of all of Scripture that is reiterated in Hebrews 9, verse 22, where the Bible says, without the the, uh, shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And so blood had to be shed in order for sins to be covered and paid for and, and for there to be forgiveness. Each of these covenants included blood sacrifice, animal sacrifice, of course, picturing the ultimate sacrifice. And picturing the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world, Jesus Christ, and his future death on the cross for our sin. And then we have the Davidic covenant in Second Samuel chapter 7. And that's the, the foundation of the new covenant that we'll, we'll speak about today in terms, of, in terms of David and a descendant of David reigning on the, the throne of David and really on the throne of Israel and the throne of the world and the, this promise descended on the throne of Israel for all eternity that only an eternal person, the Messiah, can fulfill. And that's part of what we get to look forward to. We'll talk about more when we explain this new covenant this morning. And so... It's explained, it's, it's exemplified, but then it's expected. And I would invite you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 31 this morning and, and notice how in Jeremiah this is promised to the, to the nation of Israel. This new covenant that now we are, are participants in and we're, we've been grafted in, as the book of Romans said, to enjoy the benefits of this new covenant that was really made with the nation of Israel. And it's promised for them here in Jeremiah chapter 31. If you'll turn there, we won't take a lot of time, but I want you to notice the, the prophecy of and the prediction of this new covenant. Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verse 31, where the Bible says, Behold, the days are coming says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So the new covenant, it really is a, a, a Jewish thing. We just to get to be the beneficiaries of it. He makes it with the nation of Israel. Verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers and the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, it's yet future, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And so he's speaking futuristically here in the context of the Old Testament and says there's this new covenant that's coming and it's, it's going to be characterized by this spiritual dynamic that is described for us in verse 33 in terms of the internalization of the word of God and the inner ability to obey his righteous standards and thus enjoy his blessings. It's even connected with the, that must be connected with the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it has to culminate in eternity because it says they will all know me. And centered around forgiveness, as he says there at the end of verse 34, I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And so by way of prophecy and prediction, Jeremiah tells us of of this coming covenant. And it's a covenant that that we get to be uh, beneficiaries of this new covenant the concept of this covenant and so this this new covenant is what covenant is what i want to draw our attention to because it's this covenant under which we live today and we get to enjoy but ultimately it'll be fulfilled in the end times we'll talk about that as well because that's exciting to think about also so the concept of a covenant then secondly think also in terms of the distinctions of the covenant Distinctions in terms of the differences between the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. And you can think in general terms of the Old Testament versus the New Testament. By the way, the word testament is the same word. It's the word covenant. So think of the Old Testament of the Bible versus the New Testament of the Bible. It's fitting in general terms anyway to think in the Old Covenant versus New Covenant. But there's a difference. And for this, I want to direct your attention to the book of Hebrews. If you would turn to Hebrews chapter 7, because the whole theme of the book of Hebrews is the superiority of Christ. And really with that, then the superiority of the New Covenant compared to the Old Covenant. It's so much better. 
And don't turn back, is what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Don't turn back to the Judaic system of the Old Covenant because all that's been fulfilled beautifully and wonderfully in a very superior manner in the death of of Jesus Christ and, and who he is as the great high priest. And so you see the writer of Hebrews making all these different distinctions. So you see in verses like Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 22, the writer of Hebrews saying about Jesus in this covenant... Hebrews 7, 22, by so much more, Jesus has become a, a surety or a guarantee, all right, down payment type of thing, of a better covenant. Jump ahead to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 8, where he says this, Hebrews 8, 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no, then no place would have been sought for a second because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And there he's going right back to Jeremiah 31, quoting that Old Testament text that we've already spoken of. And so there's this superior covenant and that's reinforced in Hebrews 9, 15 as well. So quickly, I just want to just distinguish between these two covenants as we think about the old versus the new. The old covenant and the priest of the the old covenant uh, were the descendants of, of Aaron versus the high priest of the new covenant is Jesus Christ himself. Five main distinctions here in this, this chart for you this morning. The tenure of the priest, the priest served for a lifetime. Versus Jesus Christ is our eternal high priest. He is forever our high priest of this covenant. The type of sacrifice, of course, was the sacrifice of, of, of the blood of bulls and goats that were brought to the tabernacle first and eventually to the temple. And, and, and time and time again, they were sacrificed. And Hebrews nine thirteen and Hebrews 10 speaks of that. But the type of sacrifice for us of the new covenant is Jesus Christ once for all. And the finality of that. And, and the power of that in terms of its ability to even cleanse our very consciences and give us sanctification and make us holy, the blood of Christ. And the frequency of, of the sacrifice, and it was continual over and over and over and over again. Hebrews 10 speaks of it in terms of even the daily sacrifice. This week I was talking to Jim Hedinga a little bit about this as we were going to make a, a call and make a visit and and one of the things that he pointed out that i thought was significant is that we have this tendency as we think about the priests of the old testament we have this tendency to to think of them as wearing very nice clothing because you know we have these pictures of the high priest and the ephod and it is it's beautiful it's amazing but that wasn't the day in and day out appearance of a priest in the old testament the day in and day out of a priest serving in the temple in the old testament era he would have looked more like a butcher than he would have somebody that was you know clothed in perfect spotless garments because of the constant blood sacrifice he probably would have been covered with a lot of that blood as a result of those sacrifices being made over and over and over and over again to simply cover the sins of the people not to completely deal with them once and for all but to simply cover them until you sinned again and so Christ didn't, didn't have to die over and over and over again. Jesus Christ, this perfect fulfillment of the new covenant, died once for all, the Bible says. I love the way it even puts it in Hebrews in that it says that he sat down, which means he finished the job, completely accomplished what he set out to do, being seated at the right hand of the Father. And so the frequency of the sacrifice is, is significant in that Christ died once for all for which we ought to be especially thankful. And then the effect in, in that the, the Old Testament sacrifice was actually, as Hebrews puts it, was actually just a, a reminder to us also of sin, this constant reminder of, of sin and its consequences because you sin and somebody had to die, something had to die. So there's this reminder that's almost morbid in a sense, but also a good reminder to how serious sin is in that sense also. But it couldn't remove sin completely versus the death of Jesus Christ, as Hebrews ten eighteen puts it, makes it such that there's this permanent forgiveness and there's no longer a need for an offering. Isn't that awesome? That Jesus Christ died once for all. 
And that's the new covenant that we get to be the beneficiaries of it, of, and that we ought to be thankful for. Aren't you glad this morning that you didn't hear sheep or goats in the foyer of First Baptist Church? Seriously. I mean, that seems funny to us, but in, in a serious sense, aren't you glad that you didn't have to bring your sacrifice today because this week you did something wrong and so you had to bring a bull or goat in to, to have it killed and its blood spilled and, and shed so that you were right with the Lord? I mean, I don't know if we think about it in those terms, but we really ought to think about it in those terms when, when we realize the superiority of what Jesus Christ accomplished once for all. And we get to be a part of that new covenant. And so there are great distinctions, and we are permanently, as the children of God, permanently forgiven because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Glorious truth concept of a covenant the distinctions of the covenants and then finally think in terms also of the ramifications of the new covenant and again i'm going to zip through a lot of scripture here I, there's a handout out there in the foyer if you want more to do additional study but on on a personal level and then on a national level we're going to speak on a personal level regard in regards to us and then more on a national level in regards to to israel first of all on a personal level in terms of personal salvation because of this new covenant and what christ accomplished on the cross both jews and gentiles both jews and gentiles i would guess that probably 90 plus percent of the people listening to my voice this morning are in the latter category the gentiles not a part of the nation of israel both jews and gentiles enjoy personal forgiveness because of christ shed blood our main text that we look at, looked at this morning stated that very clearly. For many, for the remission of sins. Christ says this is the cup of the new covenant. And that's reinforced all over Scripture. Jeremiah 31, 34, For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin will remember no more. Again, set in that context of, of, of the salvation, personal forgiveness. In the context of the new covenant, Ezekiel 36, again, in the context of the new covenant, I will cleanse you from all your filthiness. And so both Jews and Gentiles enjoy personal forgiveness. Secondly, both Jews and Gentiles enjoy new spiritual life. We speak of that in New Testament terms, but it's alluded to in the Old Testament. New Testament terms, we use phrases like Jesus used in John chapter 3 to be born again. The Bible speaks of it in terms of regeneration, being given a new heart and a new life. But it's alluded to in the Old Testament as well, and it's part of this new covenant, this new life. <clears throat> Jeremiah thirty-one thirty-three: I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. The law written on their hearts. Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart <clears throat> and put a new spirit within you. So we can, and, and believing Jews can have new life through this new covenant. Both can enjoy new spiritual life. Thirdly, both, both can enjoy the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Again, we tend to think of that as a, 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 of a, a only the New Testament speaks of that kind of idea. No, it was, it was prophesied of in the Old Testament. You understand that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon people temporarily to empower them for special acts of service, but there was no permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the Old Testament. That's a New Testament distinctive. We saw that occur in Acts chapter 2 in the beginning of the church and the ministry of the, of the Holy Spirit in that new manner in Acts chapter 2. But the Old Testament speaks of it in Exodus chapter 36 and 27. I'll put my spirit within you. It wasn't just the Holy Spirit coming upon a person temporarily to enable them temporarily for a, a great act of service. No, now we have the Holy Spirit living within us. Why? Because Jesus Christ died to make that possible. I don't know if you've ever made that connection. Jesus Christ died to make it possible under the new covenant for us to now have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, the comforter. How grateful we ought to be for that comforter, the Holy Spirit. And so both can enjoy the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So in, time, in terms of salvation, it all goes back to the cross. It all goes back to Christ. It all goes back to his shed blood to make it possible for us to enjoy all of these things that we might take for granted when we hold a little cup of juice in our hand. And we hear the pastor say, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. All of that goes back to the cross of Christ. <clears throat>
and all of those things we get to enjoy for those who know Christ as their personal Savior in terms of salvation. But also, and this is exciting, just as exciting as what we talked about already, in terms of end times prophecy. There is so much that is yet to be fulfilled, and it's all under this big umbrella called the New Covenant. God is going to fulfill in terms of, of history and the coming of Christ. Then it all goes back to the cross. It all goes back to Christ's death, making that possible too. <clears throat> Dwight Pentecost, perhaps the most prolific theologian on end times and, and prophecy, those types of things, said the following about the old and the new covenant and Christ's death, making the new covenant possible. Quote, Christ by his death laid the foundation for Israel's covenant. <clears throat> But its benefits will not be received by Israel until the second advent, end quote. So the second coming is when we'll see this in all of its glory being fulfilled. So I want to speak in terms of Israel nationally. Romans 11 speaks of this. And most of what we'll talk about will find its completion and its full fulfillment in the millennial kingdom, the 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth. So think about that in terms of what this new covenant includes for end times prophecy. Number one, it includes the restoration to and the permanent preservation of, so restoration to and the permanent preservation of Israel in the promised land. Ezekiel speaks very specifically of that. Ezekiel 34, 11 through 15, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they are scattered and I will bring them to their own land on the mountains of Israel. Jeremiah 32, 7, I will gather them out of all the countries where I've driven them. <clears throat> Those of us that are younger here don't remember Israel not being a modern nation. But perhaps some of you remember when that occurred, I believe it was 1948, when all of a sudden, to the surprise of the entire world, Israel was back in the land and declared its own sovereign nation after centuries of being dispersed and scattered all over the planet. And there was no nation of Israel in the sense that we tend to think of a nation and a government and all those things. That's prophetically significant, folks. Because it's the beginning of the fulfillment of all these wonderful end times things that are a part of the new covenant. Israel gets the land and Israel stays in the land. That's significant. It's part of prophecy. It's part of the new covenant. So restoration of and permanent preservation of Israel in the promised land. Secondly, restoration of abundant material blessings. We won't go into the details of this, but Jeremiah 32, 41, Isaiah 61, 8 speaks of... God's amazing provision, provision for the wealth of the nation of Israel. Three, the reign of the Davidic king, and I refer to him in those terms because that's how he's referred to in these texts, but we know who that Davidic king is. That's the Messiah. That's Jesus the Christ. You see it in Exodus 34 and Exodus 37. Exodus 37, 24 and 25 specifically says, David, my servant, shall be king over them. And of course, it's speaking of David in the terms of his, his descendant, Jesus to Jesus Christ reigning and ruling forever for the millennial kingdom, but also then forever and ever. Reign of the Davidic king established worldwide peace. We talked about that a little bit in, in our Christmas message from Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, where this Messiah is declared as the prince of peace. It speaks of his kingdom and how he'll rule and reign forever. And then you get other specific texts like, like I, I, or Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 26, I will make a covenant of peace and God's wonderful worldwide peace that's the result of the reign of Christ. You know, this world longs for peace, folks. It will never have it until Jesus is on the throne. And that is coming that will happen all a part of the new covenant and then finally the restoration of the temple in israel exodus chapter 37 and another old testament text that speak even of the millennial worship within that temple exodus 37 26 to 28 it says i will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore ezekiel chapter 37 ezekiel so the rebuilding of the temple those of you that are on Facebook, uh, there's an interesting organization that I follow on Facebook. It's called the Temple Institute. If you've not been to their Facebook page, I would encourage you to go there. 
It is a group of, of Jewish folks that are living in Jerusalem right now, and they are working diligently to have every part of, of what the Bible prescribes for Old Testament temple worship, every piece and part of the temple prepared. Actually, they have most of it done already. Most of it ready to go so that when they, as they anticipated, in a little different manner than we do, okay, but, but they anticipated in that they don't realize the Messiah already came once, okay, and he's coming again. They think of it in terms of the Messiah coming for the first time. But they're making all the preparations because they believe the scriptures. They believe the Old Testament scriptures that the, that the Messiah is going to reestablish worship on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And so they're making every preparation as believers in that sense um, so that it's ready when he comes. They even are working hard at finding a perfect red heifer that is necessary for the sacrifices. They're ready to go. You do know the problem with that, right, from a human standpoint. is called the rock of the Dome of the Rock, and that being a sacred place for Islam as well, and, and the significance of that as well. But it's going to happen, okay, folks? In God's good timing and as a fulfillment of these prophecies, the temple will be reestablished as a part of the millennial kingdom and the worship, looking back at the perfect sacrifice, new sacrifices will be made, reflecting on the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That is promised as a part of the new covenant. Isn't it great to know that God keeps those promises? And isn't it exciting to know that he's going to keep those promises? And that we get to be a part of it? As people who reflect Every time you hold a little cup in your hand that it contains juice that symbolizes the blood of Christ, this cup is the, is the blood, is the covenant, the new covenant in my blood, as Jesus said. So what are the, then the ramifications in practical terms for us? Or to ask the question this way, so what? Six things I'd like us to think about this morning, even as we prepare our hearts to observe the Lord's table. First of all, so what? Every time you observe the Lord's table, you ought to, okay? You should do the following six things. I like to think of it very practically. Every time I'm holding that cup and waiting for the pastor to prompt us to all partake, what should I be thinking about? Here are six practical things. Number one, you ought to look back. Look back and thank the Lord that you do not need to bring bulls and goats to temporarily cover your sin. Like I said earlier, aren't you thankful that you didn't hear that in the foyer this morning? Second, you ought to look back and praise the Lord that you, especially assuming most of us are Gentiles, that you, especially as a Gentile, get to enjoy the spiritual benefits of the new covenant. Wow, we get forgiveness and new life. And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, it's all a part of being beneficiaries of this new covenant. So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you can look back with great joy. Thirdly, look back and marvel. It's really amazing that Christ's blood sacrifice is the foundation for all of this. It's the foundation for the new covenant and all of its promises, both already fulfilled and yet to be fulfilled. So part of what we do when we hold that little cup in our hand is look ahead to the things he's going to fulfill. So look back in those different ways, but also look up. Look up and, and pray specifically for the nation of Israel, God's chosen people who for the most part have rejected the Messiah but will someday return to him. In faith, Romans speaks of that, and so do Old Testament passages of Scripture. So we ought to pray, as the, as the Old Testament says, we ought to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Israel ought to be in our prayers every day as believers. So we ought to look up and pray, but we ought to also look around. Look around to all that is happening in the world, and especially in the Middle East, and all that's going on with ISIS and Syria and the involvement of Russia in a lot of different ways. And all that's happening in those terms is preparation for the end times attack on Israel. I oftentimes refer to that as the saber rattling. It's going to ultimately culminate in the attack on, on Israel. And then 
as Israel looks like it's about to be obliterated, as Revelation describes, as it's, they're about to be obliterated, what happens? Jesus Christ comes back and rescues Israel. So all that's going on there ought to cause us to look around and realize this is just getting things ready for the return of Christ. Amen? And then finally, look ahead to that very thing. Look ahead to his return and the restoration of Israel and then him establishing his kingdom and his reign once and for all global peace. A thousand year reign of Christ and then the eternal state. It's all a part of the new covenant. So when you hold that cup again every month when we celebrate the Lord's table, don't just think I'm holding a plastic cup with juice in it. There's way, way more to that. I'm holding a cup of juice that reminds me of the blood of Christ that made all of this new covenant possible. And I am so blessed. I'm so thankful that I can have that. And I would ask you this morning, do you have that? Do you have that because you placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you repented of your sin and turned to him as the only solution to the sin problem? Because he is. His death, his burial, and the resurrection, that's the only answer to knowing that your sins are forgiven and that your destination is heaven. Observing the Lord's table does nothing to get you saved. It does nothing to buy eternal life. It does nothing to merit God's favor. It's simply a way for us to remember what already happened on the cross. And if this morning there's any uncertainty in your heart whatsoever about your eternal destiny and your relationship with God, we would encourage you not to partake of the Lord's table, but instead to turn to him in faith and repent and believe. Believe that he alone can save you from your sin. And he'll do that right where you sit this morning if you've never trusted Christ as your personal Savior. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the truths of your word and this new covenant that we enjoy. I trust that now that we better understand when we hear those words each time we observe the Lord's table.